So in the 1990s, there was an attempt to bring Captain America uh, to the big screen. And so a movie was made with, um, I forget the actor who played uh, Captain America in that, it was 1990 or 97 or something, this movie came out. I remember seeing it on uh, TV at one point, but uh, it was really, really cheesy. I mean, if I'm being honest with you, it was really cheesy. But, um, but Captain America and Red Skull, if you're familiar with uh, the villains in Captain America, but Red Skull is one of the primary villains. And uh, in the movie, Red Skull's the villain. And so Red Skull's plan is to put a microchip into the brain of the President of the United States and make him do his bidding. And uh, again, it was super cheesy and all that, but it, it, was, it was one of many examples in a number of different genres of science fiction or superhero lore and that kind of thing where this idea of mind control uh, was was put out there as a, a plot theme. And, uh, and of course, you know, anytime you think of someone controlling someone else's mind, you assume it's always through hypnosis or, um, or you know, it's portrayed as being something that you can accomplish through hypnosis or, uh, or, or a microchip in the brain, you know, that kind of thing. Well, well that sort of technology um, is, uh, is pretty advanced, to say the least, if that were possible to, to do that. Um, but the concept of controlling someone's mind in some way, again, has been the plot theme for lots of different sorts of uh, genres of literature and entertainment and all that kind of thing. Well, as it turns out, um, there is in the world of science actual progress being made in regard to creating uh, the means by which someone's thoughts can be translated into text. And I would assume, therefore, also, um, you know, uh, like an audio kind of technology as well. Um, uh, the University of Texas in Austin, um, just this morning, an article was put out and a podcast within it that uh, you can listen to when you go to the article. Uh, I posted this, by the way, on our Telegram channel. If you don't subscribe to our Telegram channel, um, I would suggest uh, if you, it's a great platform. Telegram is a really cool platform, but it's also a place where uh, I post a lot of articles like this and, and stuff that uh, we talk about on, on these posts. I'll oftentimes have links to some of these things, uh, whether it's this kind of thing in technology or whether it has to do with banking or the financial things or um, global politics. Uh, I post a lot of articles there and, and just, you know, for, for your interest in reading in that. Well, I posted uh, this article this morning uh, that came out this morning and, um, uh, or was it yesterday? Might have been yesterday, actually. But um, uh, anyway, so it's, it's an article about the University of Texas in Austin where they describe this technology that they've been working on and the success they've been having with it, uh, where they've had a number of test subjects where they've been able to essentially put them into what amounts to a, a kind of an MRI-sized kind of machine uh, where, um, where they would have the uh, test subjects listen to hours and hours of podcasts and then they would have them think about those podcasts and the thoughts they were having through a series uh, without any implantation, no surgeries, no diodes being put on their heads or anything. You know, sometimes you've seen these kind of hats almost that they wear that have the diodes connected to it that can read brain activity without any physical connection like that, from the best of my understanding, without any of those physical connections, just with sort of an MRI kind of technology. It's not MRI, but it's like that they're able to um, uh, uh, scan the, the brain activity that is going on. I think having something to do with uh, the way the blood circulates under certain stimuli and that kind of thing. Um, I have more to read on it, but it's fascinating what they've been able to do. And they've been able to use that to translate, again, the, the thoughts that these folks were having about that content that they were listening to. And, uh, and they were able to translate that into text and the text translation of what they were thinking uh, is at this point about 50% accurate. And by accurate, I mean like 50%, that 50% comprises some translations that are pretty much word for word what the person was thinking, but in other cases didn't necessarily translate it word for word per se. Uh, translate may not be the right word I'm using, but, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying. But the other part of that uh, composition of that 50% would be where the, uh, the, the technology was able to get the gist of what they were thinking. It wasn't exactly what they were thinking, but it, it captured the essence of what they were thinking. 
And so there are examples in the article that you can read about. Um, and so they have found a way through this technology to essentially read someone's mind, their thinking. Now this is a huge piece of apparatus. It requires lots of preliminary input in order to create sort of an atmosphere by which you might uh, capture the thinking of that individual who's the test subject. So it's not in any way uh, really like a, a public facing practical kind of thing where you know you're not at a stage where you know some of you are already likely thinking this. Um, it's not at a stage where you could like like without a person's knowing read their minds and understand what they're thinking. It's not at that point yet but it's at the beginning stages of that kind of technology. And the reason this technology is being touted is because it could be used in, in, in applications like, um, like in stroke victims who uh, lose the capacity to articulate what they're thinking verbally, but you'll still have the capacity to think, but they just can't say what they're thinking. They can't speak it because of the, you know, what they've experienced in, in, the, in the stroke and, and such. Uh, and other situations like this where someone might be challenged in their capacity to articulate what they're thinking, this technology would potentially allow them to do that. And so you could see where that would be a hugely beneficial technology for some in that kind of situation. It's hard not to applaud the possibilities that would exist around somebody in that kind of uh, situation now being able to be understood. Uh, or think about somebody like a Stephen Hawking that um, potentially one day, who's Stephen Hawking's past, but somebody with a brilliant physics mind like that, uh, who had to operate through a speech synthesizer that operated by the movements of his eyes, and he would essentially type, as it were, using eye motions to convey uh, ideas and sentences and stuff. Well, imagine somebody like a Stephen Hawking uh, was had the capacity to have that sort of technology convey his thoughts uh, in real time in a much faster fashion, almost conversationally. Well, there's there's a lot about that that's pretty exciting and, and pretty extraordinary, really. But of course, you know, and, and I'm thankful to hear that in this, or read, I should say, and, and actually hear, I guess, in the podcast as well, that they, they also did consider the obvious questions that arise with there, at least an obvious question that arises. Well, what if somebody, as is traditionally been true in humanity, what if somebody takes that technology and uses it for nefarious purposes, where they do utilize it to read someone's mind and potentially, um, uh, potentially, you know, read their minds and therefore have a sense of what they're thinking, and then by maybe a, a step or two away from that, potentially, uh, uh, you know, prosecute them for thought crimes. Well, that's a legitimate concern. Matter of fact, they 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 considered that in the article and uh, in the podcast that that was mentioned. Now, I will say that what they spoke about or considered in this is not robust at all. It doesn't really provide any um, any real deterrent to that, except for the fact that the technology is really nowhere near, on a practical level, ready for that kind of thing. I mean, you could argue that on some government level, somebody could be taken into custody, put into that machine. Uh, and possibly have their thoughts read and that kind of thing. Although they did say in the article uh, or in the podcast, I forget if the article said this, but I remember listening to them discuss it, that you can cognitively think of other things and throw off the whole things, uh, this, this, this so the software the, uh, and such, it's, it's capacity to understand what you're thinking. You can very easily manipulate it. And so for that, reasons like that, they consider that it's not really ready for prime time. And so, but it, it is fascinating and I think important that we recognize that this technology is beginning to exist. Um, when you combine that with the fact that things like quantum computing and AI, and this, is, this article is directly kind of being uh, carried under sort of the umbrella of AI and some of the advancements that are starting to come as a result of it, when you consider um, our, our forays into quantum computing and the advancements that are being made in that regard to where we're probably within, uh, you know, I, I can't put a number on it, but I, the, from my reading, it seems like we're within about a 10-year period of time when quantum computing will become a pretty normative reality. And of course, you combine that with AI, and you have got absolutely staggering computational possibilities 
that we are literally like, like, you know, a, sh a very short, just years away from crossing into that arena. Uh, we are very, very literally on the threshold of a paradigm shift in science, technology. Um, this weekend I was watching something on TV and they were talking about AI produced music where uh, AI, ChatGPT, essentially would write a song. It may have been ChatGPT actually. It wrote a song and then it borrowed the voices of a couple of pop stars and synthesized their voices into the song that it had written. And this song was released and apparently had like a billion downloads. And I think a large number of those people thought it was those artists performing the song. Well, that obviously raises lots of ethical questions on, a, you know, music royalties and, and, and you, know, um, you know, using people's personas and that kind of thing. There's all kinds of other questions that are raised because of this. But that in and of itself, to me, um, reminded me that, you know, the ethics of such things are way behind and are falling further behind. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Falling farther and farther behind the technology that is forcing those ethical questions to be considered. Well, when you when you integrate things like quantum computing into AI and, and, and the fact that we are sort of, you know, letting the rabbit, you know, setting this rabbit, pulling a rabbit out of a hat and then letting it run wild, um, that, that becomes a, a, a really concerning thing. I don't want to, you know, sound all alarmist, but it's hard not to recognize the potential for this getting out of hand very quickly. I don't think we're gonna see a Terminator kind of a thing happen. That's not where I'm going at all with this. I'm thinking of something far more practical that I think has its roots very much in, in, in a possible reality for us to be experiencing soon. And it gets back to the idea that I started with, and that's that idea of mind control. When the idea of mind control, even within uh, um, you know discussions nowadays, is generally viewed as being uh, sort of in the realm of conspiracy theory, but even within the realm of conspiracy theory, most of the time it has to do with the idea of maybe uh, 5G technology. You know, there are things within our system or things that are being put in our system through mRNA vaccines and 5G could potentially one day, essentially, again, I'm being massively reductionist, but uh, a switch could get flipped and 5G suddenly now uh, has the capacity to be a means through which people's minds can be controlled or their behaviors can be altered and that kind of thing. That's generally the, 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 the area that the discussion tends to reside in when you talk about these things uh, in, in regard to mind control. I would suggest something different. Um, I don't know how much of that I necessarily believe, although nowadays it's really hard to rule out much of anything. I mean, technology is pretty extraordinary nowadays. Um, and so it's not hard to imagine uh, especially like when you listen to people like uh, uh, Noah Yuval Harari talking about hacking uh, humans and that kind of thing. It's really, there's a lot of discussion uh, by well-known people that are talking about these kinds of things. So I wouldn't rule much of anything out, really. But to me, in my mind, I wonder if there isn't a much more tangible and much more adapted to human nature as it already is, means by which you might control, if not the, the brain physically, the psyche practically. Uh, and that is, if I can just sort of build a little picture, paint a picture here, if in fact we have the ability to, at some point, we're not there yet apparently, but if at some point the idea of being able to uh, recognize or determine people's thoughts and even translate people's thoughts by virtue of technology. And that technology develops quickly, which I would imagine it will, in a, in a, in a climate where AI and quantum computing are becoming much and much more sophisticated, ever more sophisticated uh, in very brief spans of time. I forget what the statistic was about technology in general, but there was a point at which technology faced a paradigm shift uh, or thinking worldviews based on technology and science uh, kids sort of a, uh, a, a quantum leap, uh, if you will, about every so many generations. And then it shrunk down to, as technology increased, it shrunk down to not generations, but decades. And then not decades, but years. Well, now we're 
we're inside of that framework where technology and the changes that are happening happen so rapidly that massive shifts take place, uh, and which by the way, not just shifts in technology, but the thinking and the mindsets, the worldviews and such that accompany those changes happen so rapidly now. And of course, when you combine it with the other, other uh, technologies like social media, where ideas and thoughts can be conveyed to global audiences in a matter of, of, of a, you know, essentially at light speed, in seconds, you know, you can have an idea propagate around the world. I read this article from Texas this morning. It came out maybe yesterday, um, but, you know, it was available yesterday, the minute someone hit enter when they were done. And that immediately becomes something that can have influence on people. I mean, I've just had access to it for a few hours, and I'm already just thinking about some of the implications of some of these things. Well, over time, as these ideas begin to propagate, more and more people uh, begin to think these things through, and they sort of begin to understand that this is where the world is, this is where the world's going. Well, when you start applying these technologies, as they become more sophisticated, um, it becomes a part of our everyday fabric. And the influence and impact that these technologies have in other areas of study or in other areas um, that affect everyday human life, things like finance, governance, um, things like social structures, things like um, uh, biotechnologies, all these kinds of things, bioethics, um, decisions and such while not necessarily being made by AI right now, are being influenced by AI. How do I know? Because the average person now, and everybody has access to ChatGPT, anybody can download the app to their phone, everybody can get on the website, everybody with an internet connection has access to, to ChatGPT. Literally, everybody, every human being that has an internet connection can get ChatGPT. Unless, maybe you're in China and they don't allow it because of a firewall or something. But um, but essentially, that technology is now being played with by virtually anybody. And that is affecting the way that we think, the way that we process, or the way that we begin to hand over the thinking process uh, to a technology because we think it'll be more accurate or it may actually create a faster way to get valid answers to hard questions. It can, it can figure out problems for us much quicker. It can write papers for us. It can create and produce content, even music, uh, apparently. And so um, it can see things now and make determinations and create recipes for things. It's, and, this, and this basically is a technology that has been in development for a long time, but is now already becoming commonly used by the average human being. There's already discussions about creating uh, AI tools um, that have the capacity to interact with us uh, on a daily level for basic normal kinds of things that um, that will that are that are sort of causing AI to become very quickly integrated into our way of living and there will be there will be practical ways in which we will rely on it in ways that we already kind of are but one day will become fully reliant on it um, this is something that on many fronts will be received as a really good thing because of the convenience that it will afford us. In many respects, psychologically, we're already on board with these things. We, we ask our phones to find things for us, to call places, to give us directions to things. We ask it for information that we used to have to spend time studying, researching, and figuring out. Now we get answers to it in seconds. It's, it's to the point where it's not just convenient, it's necessary because we don't know how to do some of those things that we used to do to figure out things. And so AI is here to stay. And again, when you couple that with quantum computing and just the, the, the sheer um, magnitude of how that will affect computing and the large kinds of issues that quantum computing will will make possible to solve and to do in instantaneous fashion. Um, you know, I used to, I, I, I still am enamored with Star Trek and the technology and starships and all that kind of thing. Well, the idea of building a starship and traveling light speed and all that kind of stuff, that's, some of that is physically impossible. But, but just the technology that you could create a computer that can 
that can manage something like that so effortlessly and such expectation on part of humans to live in that kind of environment, that's not so far-fetched anymore. The idea of, of, of reliance upon technology to the point where it is so deeply integrated into our daily lives is something that is just, we just take it for granted now. And it's almost to the point where we, we, we couldn't live without it. And that's a really weird place to be. But anyway, how does that connect with the idea of mind control? Well, if you start adapting this technology to things like ESG, where all of a sudden you cannot just follow someone's buying habits or their travel habits or um, or what they you know what they say on social media, you know, we we sort of have to externally look at those things, or maybe we apply algorithms to to sort of understand putting together and, and uh, compiling information about people. But imagine you could actually read someone's thoughts, not control them by virtue of planting thoughts in their minds or putting a microchip in their brain, but just the fact that you could know what someone's thinking. Now, right now, I think that's partly contingent upon, you know, part of this information is gleaned by the way that blood flows through the system and through the, the brain and stuff as you're thinking about certain kinds of things. I think it's it's depending somewhat upon that kind of thing. So it's not like, you know, there's a machine that could just simply look at a picture of you and tell you what, tell what you're thinking. And so, but right now, the way things are right now in that technology is not what it will be in what I, I was going to say 10 years. It's not what it will be in six months. In six months, this technology will have been enhanced and, and developed and cultivated to the point where some jump forward in this, in this, in this uh, technology's capacity will have improved to where maybe it doesn't then rely on blood flow. Maybe now it, it, it relies on some other thing. Maybe there is something about the motion of your, uh, of your eyelids or something, who knows, that, that sort of triggers uh, some element of how they determine, uh, you know, uh, how they can determine what you're thinking, whatever. I'm just speculating right now, but technologies improve over time. And at some point, it will become ready for prime time. Well, when it becomes ready for prime time, suppose, you know, what do you think happens when, um, when that technology uh, built upon the kind of robust computing power that is being developed is employed in determining not just how somebody has traditionally been spending their money or, or responding to social issues on social media or, um, or any of that kind of thing, now they have that, but they also have the capacity through ever increasing, uh, you know, video technology, they can enhance their understanding of what you think by building on what they already know about you with the way that you look, the way that you act in social situations, the way that you, uh, um, you know, if you, the way you respond in a given situation that they can view through a camera, through a lens of some kind. And then that is then applied to your ESG score, where suddenly your, you know, um, you know your environmental social governance perspective on things. Uh, it's it's the kind of thing that we should be giving thought to. Again, I'm I am not prone to alarmism, so I'm I'm trying to make sure that even though I'm sharing some speculative ideas, these speculations I think are reasonable based upon the technologies and the mindsets that are being cultivated right before our very eyes. And I guess I, and so when I say, when I come back to the mind control thing, I don't think it will necessarily require that someone plant thoughts into your head by virtue of technology, but just if you are aware that your thoughts can be held against you in the way that you are allowed to function in society, then you are by definition, if you want to function in that society, you are by nature, I should say, likely going to change your thinking. I was not opposed to this particular thing, but I've, I know that if I am opposed to it and they know that they can, they can tell that I'm opposed to it, not just by my social media and stuff, but they can actually interpret my thoughts based on my physical responses, then I, how do I avoid that? How do I keep from that affecting me and my capacity to function in this society? Well, 
since that's all internal that's finding expression, I guess I need to change my thinking. Well, for a believer, that's, that's a non-starter. We're not going to do that. But to the average person that doesn't have a biblical perspective, that doesn't know where this is all going, that just wants to function in society, I guess I really just can't have such a strong view against some of these ideas because it's going to be held against me and used against me when it comes to am I going to the grocery store if I need to buy gas or if I want to take a trip or I need medical attention or something. Uh, my ESG score does not allow me to have that and my ESG score has been cultivated not just by what I've done in the past but what they can see in my responses now. Well, I guess I just need to change my perspective on this if I want to function in this world. That's a scary thought. Now all of a sudden, your very humanity is being used against you, not just the way that you've responded outwardly before, but your very humanity right now suddenly becomes a means through which you can either be part of the system or not, or you can keep yourself out of the system. Now that again, that sounds like it crosses a line a little bit. Hey man, I thought you were trying not to be sensationalized. I really am trying not to be sensationalized. Um, but it is, a, it's, I think it's unreasonable for us not to consider these possibilities. I think it's unreasonable for us to intentionally assume that there's no way this couldn't happen. This couldn't have happened five years ago. This couldn't have happened 10 years ago. This, this couldn't have maybe happened a few years ago. It can't happen today. But we're not too far away based on, again, the speed at which things change and the kinds of technologies that are being cultivated and the worldviews that are accompanying these changes. We are not far from the things that I'm talking about becoming potential realities. Um, and I would say that it behooves us to make sure that we are not ignorant of those realities. Now, one of the, one of the ways that a people can be overcome is by virtue of being overwhelmed. The things that I'm talking about here are things that if they happen tomorrow or if they happen in a year or two or five years or ten years from now, there's very little that any of us would be able to do to change that from happening. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't say there's nothing we could do because who knows what the landscape will look like, you know, politically or whatever, you know, and, and the Lord could always bring a change. I mean, he could, he could turn things around. But some generation was going to be the generation that saw the world become globalized fully uh, behind a global economic, political system, um, a, um, basically the fabric of the global society will be one color, one shade, uh, will be in unison. And those who are believers in the days leading up to that and those who are around during that time are going to be persona non grata in it. They're not going to be welcomed in it because they won't be, want to be part of it because they understand who will one day be at the helm of that globalized system, the Antichrist or the, the beast of Revelation 13. Um, and so when we consider these things, I don't personally think there's anything we're going to be able to do to stop that from happening. And as we always say, when we consider these things, what we're doing is looking at what's happening and saying, okay, well, this seems to be a means through which we could arrive at what the scriptures say about the conditions of the time uh, when Antichrist is on the scene and, and the, the last seven year period leading up to Christ's return. So why talk about it if we can't do anything about it? Well, when I say we can't do anything about it, what I mean is we're probably not gonna stop this from happening, but we can respond to it. And what I don't mean is that we take up arms and try and, you know, blow up um, Skynet or whatever. You know, that's not what I'm saying. I just, but what I do think is that we do need to be aware of what's going on around us so that we can prepare ourselves for the world that we're potentially going to be living in very soon. Uh, if we remember in the larger picture that part of the end game here is, again, bringing the world into a globalized system. And so... As the world moves that way, what is that going to mean on a practical basis? What does that mean for you and I in, in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, it means that we're going to have to be thinking about what it will be live, like to live in a world where we don't have such ready access to gas for our cars because everything's going to go green and electric cars are going to be what 
what are going to be the norm and there's going to be penalties and fines for using cars that um, that burn so much emissions and if you burn so much emissions then your ESG score is eventually going to be um, affected by that and you won't have enough social credits to ultimately uh, buy all the stuff that you're used to buying today so how will you respond to that um, you know if if your perspective on um, hot button issues like transgenderism don't line up with um, with uh, you know the the current global thinking on that well again that's going to affect your capacity to have access to things whether it's practical physical uh, material needs or whether it's access to being able to post like this anymore maybe online maybe you don't have access to the internet now um, who knows what that could take but there's an expression desperate times call for desperate measures and I would argue that it's very likely that in an effort to bring the world under the auspices of this kind of thinking it there will be some sense in which they will use that argument to um, governments of the world will utilize that kind of thinking desperate times desperate measures we have to put a clamp down on a lot of things because there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation being propagated out there and the only way we can find to stop it is by uh, penalizing those who we believe are propagating it well again uh, in, a, in a world where technology like what we're talking about today is becoming more sophisticated uh, when that time comes uh, when those powers that be want to do that they're going to have the tools in our arsenal to do that and we have to be of the mind this is why we why we make ourselves aware of this kind of thing because we don't want to be surprised when it happens instead we want to be ready and have and be part of strong believing communities that are there to support one another uh, that we can be ready to help each other when we don't all have access to the kinds of things that we do now well wait a minute i thought we we're going to be raptured before that happens we don't know that uh, i believe we'll be raptured before the antichrist comes on the scene personally but that doesn't mean a lot of this stuff couldn't sort of be in place before he's ever on the scene uh, certainly before he ever makes himself known and signs that peace covenant with Israel, there's there's a lot of the stuff we're talking about could become a reality before that ever happens. And uh, and we want to remember the rapture is not given so that we might just escape hardship. That's not what the rapture is at all. The rapture is, is to pull us out before God's wrath comes upon the earth. Well, that's going to happen after the Antichrist is on the scene. So that means that by definition, we're going to likely uh, are in concert with the Antichrist coming on the scene. So... Again, my view is that that begins with the breaking of the first seal in Revelation 6 and the Antichrist coming on the scene. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about is getting closer and closer to becoming a reality in our day, and it doesn't require an Antichrist to necessarily become a reality in our day. Uh, it will be stuff that he uses, no doubt, but it can be existing before he's ever on the scene. And so I think uh, that the church in our day is going to become, is going to need to become more and more like the church in the first century did or was uh, where there is a strong sense of reliance upon one another where there is a uh, um, a readiness on the part of believers to have a strong sense of priority of a kingdom mindset that we recognize our citizenship is of that kingdom and not of this world and that's going to mean that we're not going to be seen uh, if you will we will be seen more and more globally speaking as enemies of the state as it were if i can just sort of use that terminology and so we're going to need each other as believers more and more um, it's going to be a necessity for us i think to adopt and embrace very firmly a first century mindset um, hardship is promised to believers in this world you will have tribulation jesus said but be of good cheer for i have overcome the world and there is a day coming when we will see that fully realized, when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, Revelation 11, 15. But in the meantime, uh, we need to recognize that we are not guaranteed smooth sailing throughout our lives here in a world in which we are ambassadors to and not citizens of. So, so that being said, that's kind of where I always like to bring these things back around to. It's like these are, these are frightening concepts to consider. They just are. And I think that... If we take a position of an ostrich hiding its head in the sand, thinking that if I don't see it, then it must not be real or it won't, it won't get me, that's a foolish mindset. That's not wise at all. Um, these things will still happen, whether or not we're trying to hide ourselves from it. And all we end up doing by trying to hide ourselves from it is keeping ourselves from being prepared to exist in it. 
And so that's why I think we need to take measures to build our, our sense of fellowship amongst other believers uh, in strong fellowships. We need to be students of the word. We need to be in prayer. We need to do some practical things. I think it's important to store up some food and things like that just in case it becomes necessary to, um, you know, or things become expensive or inaccessible or something like that. It's just, you know, we talked about these things before. I'm not a survivalist, you know, again, um, um, you know, sky is falling kind of a person, but there's just wisdom in the practical reality of being prepared for things that could slash will happen in the days to come. So let me encourage you um, in those ways to recognize that God is in control and that at the end of the day is going to accomplish his purposes. Jesus will return and establish his kingdom. Uh, you and I as believers will rule and reign uh, with him when that time comes. Uh, we can know with a certainty these things are true. God's word is, of course, uh, not going to fail. But we want to understand that in the days leading up to his return, uh, and even prior to that, uh, the days leading up to his coming to get his church, uh, in these days in which we live, we should not expect things to just continue as they always have. We should recognize that things are going to um, are going to be very, very different in the relatively near future, and we should not think for a moment that the status quo is going to remain in place. So that being said, uh, I'll post uh, some articles that you can read, that you can uh, do some looking into yourself. And um, and let me encourage you to do that very thing, to, to not be a stranger to these ideas, to not let these concepts surprise you or catch you off guard, but rather instead to, um, to make yourself aware of what's going on. And I appreciate you watching and listening. And uh, we'll continue to do these prophecy updates and we'll continue to take a look at what's going on. And, uh, and uh, until, until next time, the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace forever. So Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace to us. We are very grateful that in, in the midst of a world that is clearly under the sway of the wicked one and uh, the God of this age, the spirit of the age is certainly hard at work turning things uh, in such a way as to trouble our hearts and to cause us to, uh, to, uh, to fall into a sense of fear. And Lord, while you know we don't want to pretend that these realities are not uh, coming upon us, they may be gradual, it may be slow, but they're moving in the direction that we're, uh, in, in, that we're trying to pay attention to. But at the end of the day, we don't forget that you are the one who is in control. You told us that things were going to get worse uh, in the days leading up to Christ's return. And we do pray for revival. We do pray for a great outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray for a huge uh, uh, influx of people coming to faith in Christ. We want to see that. Um, whether or not we will see that is something that is obviously, um, you know, you know. And it's in, uh, you, know, I mean, you know all these things. So we do hope it. But we also would ask that you would help us not to be naive about the times in which we're living and what's going on around us. But instead, we would pay attention. Uh, we would walk in wisdom, not fear, uh, walking in faith, but also to walk in wisdom and not to try and hide ourselves from and, and, uh, and believe that ignorance will somehow protect us from what's going on around. Rather, instead, help us to have a clear, open-eyed view of what's happening and recognize that at the end of the day, we know that when this world comes to the worst place it's ever going to get to, right under the auspices of Antichrist and full swing rebellion against Christ that is coming, we know that his coming will not be stopped. His kingdom will uh, certainly be established, and there will be no question whatsoever uh, who is ruling and reigning in that day. And we thank you that we'll rule and reign along with him. We will be coming back with him when he returns. All of those things that, that will follow this time, that we will see in that time, are things that bring us great joy. Uh, even uh, as Christ endured the cross, despising the shame, but looking ahead to the glory that lie ahead, so too we don't love these times we're living in. But we do thank you, looking ahead to the time that we will be living in when Christ returns. And so we praise you, we bless you, and we thank you for that great hope uh, in the coming of Christ. And so, Father, we thank you. We praise you. Help us again to be walking in faith and not in fear. And help us to be ready to change as necessary in terms of the way we approach our lives practically so that we would not um, be caught unawares any more than... Uh, in the same way that Jesus expected the Pharisees, the scribes, to recognize the signs of his first coming, help us to be aware of the signs that are precipitating and leading toward your second. Thank you, Father. We love you. We bless you and praise you for all of this. In Jesus' name.